The African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and religion. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they've been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Fitzgerald Miller, the current president of the 100 Black Men Incorporated. Hi, Fitz. Glad to have you with us today. Nice to meet you, Dr. Roscoe. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. You are the 10th president of the 100 Black Men that goes back 50 years. You weren't even born then. So tell us a little bit about the history of the 100 Black Men and how you plan to develop that history in your presidency. Well, first, it's an honor, and most well, certainly on behalf of the board of directors and the uh, officers and the members, it's an honor to be on this show and be speaking with you. Um, I follow in your footsteps, uh, most certainly you know as a uh, former president, so it, it, it's a double dose of a pleasure. But as you know, the 100 Black Men started in 1963 um, out, a, out of a, a real ser serious issue. During the time, um, there was many issues that our community faced. Economics, health and wellness, education, uh, political advancement, you, you name it. We faced those issues. The 100 black men, there was a group of men that started this organization. And you know many of them over the course of the years. Uh, Honorable David Dinkins uh, was one of those founders, uh, one of our uh, members that just recently passed, Honorable uh, Jackson, Judge right. Jackson. So we have a history of great men just like yourself and those men who decided that, yes, we achieve milestones, successes, but we thought about how do we come together, use our collective resources, use our collective talents to improve not just our community, but also bridge a relationship and foster a relationship across communities to really advance our cause. What we've accomplished so Well, let's recall that the 100 Black Men was founded before the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964. Absolutely. Before the Voting Rights Act was passed. That's right. And basically there was discrimination against African Americans moving into top political and governmental positions. And again, there was some profiling by the police, which started an incident that uh, one of the deputy commissioners who became our first president, Bob Mangum, uh, had to right. be involved in protesting. So the 100 black men really came out of protests and then development of the black community. And over time, after Martin Luther King's assassination and after the Civil Rights Bill, uh, we were able to broaden out to con consider education, and economic development and health and housing. So th that's part of the tradition of the organization. And you, as a young man who's now succeeded to be the president, is trying to carry that out. Now, what are you doing currently to try to carry out some of those things? We're doing uh, a number of things. Um, one of the things that we're doing is making sure that we stick to the core values of the organization, purpose. Why were we created? Going back to the history which you just outlaid. Number two, making sure that we have the right planning, the right planning process. What that means is incorporating our membership. We're a membership organization, not just anyone. Who, who are the members? What are the qualifications to be a member? Uh, you have to be invited. <laughs> you have to be invited in. Someone needs to sponsor you in because this is an organization that is really supported by men of character and integrity. But what kind of men of character are you getting? What do they do? How do they decide to join the organization? Well, they come out, we invite them out to uh, our informational sessions. Uh, we work, like for example, I mean, they work on Wall Street. They're doctors, they're lawyers, they're businessmen, they're uh, professors. Mm -hmm. These are men, they're firemen, they're police officers. There's a diverse range of individuals who are involved with this organization. The thing that we look for is men who understand the importance of helping other people. This is not a self-motivation, self-aggrandizement, if you will, uh, organization. And we do that through the committees, the uh, 
health community, the economic development community, the education community, the international affairs, because basically, as you know, that is the way the organization really gets things done. The president alone can't do everything. No, I, I, <laughs> I love you so much. That's exactly what I've been trying to focus on for the last uh, six, seven months since I uh, became president of the organization. Um, I served under three presidents, and most certainly I was mentored by you, Godfrey Moraine, who was one of our founders. Mm -hmm. um, I speak to uh, Dave Dinkins, I speak to uh, Paul Williams, Phil Banks, and so, and most certainly uh, one of our past presidents who, who passed away, God bless him, and most certainly he's always in our prayers, Luther Gatlin. And so, when I take a look at the broad spectrum of experience and understand the membership, mm -hmm. the basic core of what we do is activation of our committees. Mm -hmm. When you become a member of the 100, it's not for you to just pay your dues and say, I'm a member of the 100, but it goes back into exactly what you say. So what are we doing? Economic empowerment. We have to focus on that. When you think about the national unemployment rate right now, is at 7.8%. In the African American community, it is 14.8%. That's nationally. The youth unemployment rate is 34%. Among African American? Among African American youth. That, that's 18 to 24. That's how the statistics are captured. So when we correlate um, the unfortunate circumstances on the streets, um, and the alternatives that's being offered on the streets, and you look at the high unemployment, the 100 black men, if you take a look at what we're doing, we're providing a real solution. You were president and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Under your leadership, we focused on education. And as we continue to grow, we now have five Eagle Academies through the strategic work we're doing with our tell, foundation. Tell us what the Eagle Academy is. What do they do? The Eagle Academy is a public high school open to any young man in New York City. It's a single sex school. Single sex school uh, under the leadership of, of, uh, of uh, David Banks, who's heading up our foundation now, Eagle Academy Foundation. Um, they're responsible for going out and, and taking a look at that. The 100 black men is responsible for the mentoring, the model and the relationship between the 100 black men and the foundation and the strategy, the Eagle Academy for Young Men, which the 100 black men founded, seems to be working. Um, we need more mentors. We know the model works because what we're doing is when we first uh, went into taking a look at the statistics, African-American and Latino men had a graduation rate in New York City at 36%. When the 100 black men says, no, we're not going to accept this, that graduation rate went from 87% to 93% with our involvement. 87% of which school? With the, one, with the Eagle Academy. Mm -hmm. Now, the Relative Eagle to Academy other schools is in the a city. public school. Yes, sir. That your teachers are hired by this. Department of Education. Yep. Now, what is the actual role of the 100 black men other than saying we should have a single sex school? Our role is specifically to focus on mentoring and incorporating the other programs that we have, which you just highlighted economic empowerment, health and wellness, and then, of course, we provide scholarships and, and other ancillary, uh, I want to say, benefits to, to our young people. Last year, um, actually over the last couple of years, we gave out over $300,000. Over the course of the 100, we gave out over a million dollars. So when we talk and we speak to uh, our corporate partners, <clears throat> they, might, they may not necessarily know the young man in the South Bronx or Southeast Queens or Brooklyn or the Harlem areas. But we know them. We're in the community. We live there. And so the, the, the strategic relationship between our corporate partners and our individual partners who give to the 100, they actually see the tangible results that we're producing in, in the community. Well, what is the theory behind having a single sex school? Why do you want to have a school that's limited only to males? You know, that's a very good question because 
I grew up with going to uh, uh, a co-ed school. Well, most of the school, there are very few single-sex schools, and I think the 100 Black Men and the uh, Women's Academy about the first single-sex schools in New York State. Absolutely. Now, what were the advocates expecting to achieve by having a single-sex school? Actually, I was on that committee. Uh, on the Paul Williams, who was the president at the time, said, you know, we got to create the Legacy Committee, which the birth of the Eagle Academy. What we found out was that having a single-sex school, one, the young men focus. They focus. There's no. Why do they girl. focus more on single sex than in a, a heterosexual school? Uh, you know, I really don't have the definitive you answer, but I think they just focus. On. <laughs> but I, actually, as an educator, I'll point right, out. Right, right. Basically, the idea was to have something that reinforces the image okay. of those young men and have role models for them. It is still in process. The ma main thing is, if it works, it works. It works. And. If it doesn't work, you have to modify it. Absolutely. And there are some single-sex schools for girls, and some of those work and some of them don't work. In the final analysis, doesn't it come down to the leadership? It does. And, you know, you make a good point here because certain, if you go out into, like, certain boroughs and around the world, they're prep schools where you can only be a boy, you can only be a female, for example, to go to those schools. And so what we're doing uh, is really no different. We're doing it in the inner city, and we're doing it through public education where everyone can participate and be involved. And one of the things that I really love about this, the model of the 100 black men and the relationship that we have with uh, the Eagle Academy Foundation as we grew out that organization, and having great leadership like yourself who really continue to help us is that it's a public school it's not a private school mm -hmm. any young man in New York City who wishes to have academic standards have positive role modeling and understand the basics that education is a strategy for you to move forward understanding the diversity of the global marketplace understanding that you got to take care of your health Understanding that economic empowerment is a great conversation to have. Understanding that you have to give back. The doors of the 100, that's one of the things I love about our model, our logo, this, this pen I'm wearing. Now, one of the questions is, is this limited only to African Americans? Could uh, a Latino, could an Asian, could a Caucasian go into the school? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We have uh, in this school, and again, let me footnote this. It is a public mm -hmm. school. And you have to go through the process of applying. You go to, we have uh, literally every year about 5,000 young men mm -hmm. because they hear about it. You know, this weekend we're taking a group of young men, African American, Latinos, uh, Asians, down to uh, Baltimore, to the Reginald Lewis uh, Museum down in Baltimore, Maryland. Mm -hmm. New York City public education, yes, it works. But the reality of it is, it takes organizations like the 100 Black Men through leadership, mm -hmm. advocacy, and community service and combining that. That's one of the things that our 50th year that we're advancing going forward is that we're a leadership organization. And you, we have to take the lead in terms of the issues that we're facing in our community. What about job development and economic development, right? I absolutely, you know, I, I, I said a few moments ago, when I take a look, you know, um, when I, I work on Wall Street, as you know, and I, I read a lot same, similar to yourself, there is no question that we have to tackle this issue. And one of the things that I tell and I promote, not just to the organization, but to, to our community partners and our corporate partners, that the government can solve these problems. People have to take initiative and come up with the creativity and have some level of responsibility. What are we doing in terms of economic uh, empowerment? One, I put together a team, which goes back to exactly what you asked me before. You have to activate these members. When you're a businessman 
and you're not on the Economic Empowerment Committee, and you're not bringing thought leadership, you're not bringing great ideas, you're not trying to figure out how do we solve this problem, then why you became a member of the 100? We have our second vice president, Eugene Marsh. He just got reelected, or reappointed, I should say, to President Obama's National Economic Committee for Minority and Div Women Diversity Council. He chairs that up. We have Phil Morrow, who's the president and CEO, which you well, would just honor. Specifically, what's 100 black men going to do? We're doing training. We're doing training. Uh, we're doing... Um, training to do what? We're doing training in terms of getting certified as a small business contractor. Mm -hmm. We're working with some strategic partners mm -hmm. to take a look at how do we integrate them into construction sector. I specifically am on the service side. So one of the things that I'm taking a look at our corporate partners and relationships, we have a lot of small business owners. How can we integrate our small businesses into your diversity supplier programs? Mm -hmm. So we're creating those opportunities where our small businesses have access to our corporate partners to be able to be suppliers and then of course that chain ripples. And now, now there are all rules and regulations about minority involvement in various public works projects. That's right. And that's where government does have a role to make sure that there's opportunity for people to get the contracts, do the training, and do the development of the community. You know, you, you're great, and I think... Well, you're great because you're going to do it. <laughs> I am. You know, with your blessings and God, God grace, uh, I'm going to work my butt off to make sure it happens. You know, I had a... Uh, uh, conversation, you know, Congressman Gregory Meeks, mm -hmm. who, who's on our board, and Congressman uh, uh, Rangel. Rangel. Um, you know, I have conversations with them. We have to have, and most certainly out of uh, Brooklyn now, we have uh, Congressman um, Hakeem Jeffries. You just put a really great underlying score to this. Our elected officials, when we elect these individuals who are responsible for the allocation of resources, African Americans, uh, just like any other group, need to be a part of a conversation in terms of distribution of how these contracts. And it's not like you're a asking for handouts. Mm -hmm. You said, "Listen, but part well, of the, opportunities as well." Part of the problem, unfortunately, is some of these groups have not been accountable. That's exactly right. One of the right. things that the hundred black men insist on is accountability. I love you. Mm -hmm. That is one of the reasons when I ran for president. Mm -hmm. And thank you for your vote, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's accountability. And I, t I, I told the membership, I said, if you vote for me, mm -hmm. first of all, hold me accountable. Number two, hold yourself accountable. Mm -hmm. We have to hold each other accountable before we go out and ask someone else to be accountable to us. Mm -hmm. Because the reality of it is we pay tax dollars, we buy cars, we buy clothing, we do all of the everything else that any other American is doing in this country. And when you take a look at the economics, there's an imbalance. Mm -hmm. There's an imbalance. So you say, well, how, how is this possible? Well, one reason it is because of the education deficit. Absolutely. One of the things that you find that African Americans do not graduate at the same rate as the general population. And that's something that the Eagle Academy and others are trying to address. But it's more than just a few successful places. The system has to respond and that's one of the objectives of the, uh, the 100 black men to get the system wrong, to bring the politicians to your meetings so they can explain what they're doing. And even those that you don't agree with, bring them there so you can have a dialogue with them. You know what, I tell you, I need to, as, as, as I speak to a lot of members, I definitely need you as part of the advisory board and the team of the 100. One of the things I'm structuring is that advisory board, and these are great ideas. Mm -hmm. I actually have begun to work out a roadmap mm -hmm. because the w we as a community, again, it goes back to the, the concept of leadership, advocacy, and community service. On a quarterly basis, the politicians, the 100 black men should be hosting in conjunction with other strategic organizations, but we should be hosting a leadership forum mm -hmm. to have these elected officials 
Tell us what's going on in front. Because most people actually don't know what's going on in And to also state. question them. And question them, that's right. Support for various projects in our community. Absolutely. And uh, support for the MTA, support for the Department of Education, the Energy Department, and so on. Absolutely. Now, you, 100 Black Men has been around for 50 years, and you're going to celebrate the 50th anniversary. Tell us about how you're going to celebrate that. I'm excited about that. I really am. Um, I couldn't be more excited about um, where we were, how much we've achieved, and where we're going. You know where we were, mm -hmm. and you know what we've achieved, but the future even looks even brighter. Next year, well actually in the fall, we'll be opening up our fifth, fifth Eagle Academy in Harlem. Under the Department the, of Education, the Department of Education, we'll be supporting. We'll it. be supporting it. That's right. <laughs> Thank you very much. We will be supporting it. Department of Education, um, and through the foundation, we'll be supporting that. I'm excited about that. We have um, a number of events. One, Economic Empowerment Summit, Health and Wellness Town Halls. Youth Summit, Mentoring, Family Day, and then of course our Brotherhood Reception. We're we, we, uh, going to figure out the details on that in terms of... The Brotherhood Reception is a tradition where we honor someone from the larger community who's made a contribution to improving race and community relations. That's right. And over the years, mayors and senators and of corporate leaders have been honored at that brotherhood reception. It is probably, um, when I became a member of the 100 um, in 1999, <laughs> um, I was blown away. Um, I was blown away when I went to my first reception of the brotherhood, and I saw the diversity. I was young. Um, I had just started my practice um, in terms of financial services as a financial advisor. And I misused that opportunity with regards to, uh, you know, just being young and not really understanding the dynamics mm -hmm. of what was really happening. You know, you go out there and you want to pass out business cards um, as opposed to really building relationships. And after that event, I was like, wow. You know, I met you. Mm -hmm. uh, I met, uh, you know, uh, Paul Williams, I met uh, Dave Dinkins, Charlie Ring. I mean, there was this high-powered people. And then, of course, from the larger community, Howard Rubenstein. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're meeting some serious people at the brother Brotherhood Reception. And I'm thinking to myself, how is it that the 100 black men is able to bring the power players mm -hmm. from around the state in one room. This is a standing room. I said, wow. So we'll, we'll, we'll be doing that again. These are, you know, top CEOs, politicians, um, movers and shakers, if you will. Now, at the gala, uh, who are you going to honor and how do people hear about the gala? Well, one of the things I always encourage people um, to go to our website, www.ohbm.org. It's right on the uh, on our the invitation is on on the website. This year we we honoring one of our founders, the Honorable David Dinkins, uh, Carl McCall, um, Kevin Powell, who is uh, with uh, he's the global chief strategist, uh, I, I think, uh, for uh, uh, McDonald's, Vivian Ficard, who is uh, the president. Uh, general Manager for uh, uh, General Motors. I'm sorry, she's the president for General Motors uh, a Foundation. Uh, James Reynolds, who is with uh, Loop Capital. He's the chairman and CEO and founder of uh, Loop Capital, which is an investment banking firm. And then we have three outstanding young men. You know, I was honored as mentor of the year twice with the 100. That's what we focus on, mentoring our young people. We have three great young men from UPS, which is one of our strong corporate partners. Um, we're going to be honoring them. Um, and I'm, I'm excited for these men because they started and they, they, they've made a difference. And that's what we really try to focus on. 
And then, of course, we have some great hosts, uh, Gary uh, uh, Alexander. Alexander from uh, Fox. Uh, I think it's Fox or Fox? Yeah, Channel 5. Channel 5. And Channel Dave Ushery from Yes, uh, and David Ushery. Channel, well, Channel obviously, we, lo David, we love David, right? <laughs> He's a great guy. So now we're going to have a great evening, um, and most certainly we want people to come out and support. Now, the 100 Black Men is not just 100 men. What, what's your total membership now? <laughs> I, I, you know... We're not. Then as high as four or five hundred. Yes, as low as hundred. I'm sure it's and it fluctuates close to two hundred. Well, we whatever. have about fifty guys right now in the pipeline. What number do they call? Two one two, seven 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 zero seven zero. Today on uh, African American Legends, we've been talking with Fitzgerald Miller about the uh, long and distinguished history of the hundred black men about the upcoming celebration of his 50th anniversary and those great plans that Fitzgerald Miller is going to execute as the president of the 100 Black Men. You know, I love you so much. Uh, you know, you're going to help me execute, and the members are going to help me execute. That's right. I can only be a, a uh, great leader, and we can only be a great organization when everyone is involved, everyone can participate, and feel that they belong to something greater. Okay. Than